the RPG Maker General Podcast, or the RPG MGP. You are in a dimly lit room. You see a flask. Exits are North, South, West, and Dennis. Thank you all for tuning in to the RPG Maker General Podcast, or the RPG MGP. This is Cody, a.k.a. Marpix, with me today are Carbonic. Hey, um, hey. And back from the dead, it's Red Mage. Hello. I am, in fact, back from the dead. It's not quite a lich, but I'm still working on it. <laughs> How hard is it to make a flactory, by the way? Uh, it, it's mostly the money. That's the worst part. It's like 10,000 GP or something, if I remember right. I don't have that kind of money. Ah, shit. Shit. <laughs> you know what? Just take your retirement fund and rename it to, to flactory fund. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that's a good idea. And while I have you on the line, you weren't here for the anniversary edition, so I get to spring you with some lightning round questions. Are you ready? Oh, boy. No, but go ahead. <laughs> of course not. All right, who is your favorite superhero? Uh, probably gonna have to go with Spider-Man. Hmm. The last time you got mad at a video game. Uh, last time I got mad at a... Shit. <laughs> uh, oh, actually, just, just... Actually, pretty recently, now that I think about it. All right, so I'm playing the Dragon Ball Fusion game on 3DS, and there's, like, these races that you have to do, and at one part... There's, like, these fucking gravity wells that just pull you off to the side. And it was the most, like, absolutely frustrating experience that I've had with a video game in years. So, yeah, no, that. So <laughs> That, right so, there. So, like, you're flying around DBZ style and just a, a black hole sucks you in? Well, there's, like, courses. They're, they're training, I'm air quoting, that you have to complete. But, and you basically kind of fly around in, you know, full 360 degree, wherever you want to go. But... There's, like, rings that you got to fly through, and then they'll put, like, a ring, and then right next with this gravity well. So you have to, like, fly, like, like 30 to 40% to the opposite direction of the gravity, gravity well, so it, like, pulls you in so you can fly right through the ring. Because there's very little room for error. Oh, God. Yeah, it's awful. So, so... I beat them all. It's awful. <laughs> they made a game worse than Superman 64. Yeah, pretty much. That, that aspect, absolutely. Everything else in the game is fucking great, but mm. that is shit is just awful. Uh, all right, one final one. What meme needs to die? What meme? Hot? I, I'm not a 4 channer. I don't meme. Uh, <laughs> fucking, do, is Doge already dead? Can it stay dead? <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> Doge has been dead for four years, you ninny. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there, that's still my vote because I still I still hate it. Dig it, it back up. Changed. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't meme very hard. I apologize. <laughs> that's fine. We'll get to some news. Uh, February, uh, apparently, is Yume Nikki month. There's a Yume Nikki Discord, and they agreed to make February a month to generate interest and content for the fandom. So they have, like, a set of drawing prompts. And, I mean, they're not necessarily drawing prompts. You can, like, write about them or something, you know, like your favorite dreamscape, what happened to the dreamer in a past life, or, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. I've never actually played it, so this maybe I'll play it for Yume Nikki month. Hmm. It seems to have a really interesting fan base because, you know, I keep hearing about it, I keep seeing the art, but then the game itself is you're just, you're exploring things. It seems kind of like yeah. a, like an LSD trip. Yeah, it is, it is like the origin of the walking simulator games, I'm pretty sure. If, <laughs> if not, it's one of the early, early ones in that genre. Mm. What sets it apart from Dear Esther, though? Because I know in Yuma Nikki, like, you can stab things, so there is gameplay, because you don't stab anything oh, in Dear oh. Esther. Oh, okay. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that shows you what I know about Yume Nikki, so... Mm. Yeah, it's technically a game because murder. That that kind of intrigues me, because like with Yume Nikki, it brings you all these different spots, and then you have like webcomics like Homestuck, which seem to draw a lot of like artists to them. There's, there seems to be a thing that artists really, really like, and if you can just kind of tap into that small sense of the unusual, then you could probably get a good fan base. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of unusual, Tomb Dude, one of our friends from RPGMG, he released a new trailer for Tomb of Friends 2. Uh, it's coming out. Yeah, to Tomb of Friends 1 is still in my 2 playlist, but I have watched the trailer, and it actually made me want to go back so I can be ready for Tomb of Friends 2. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm excited for it. Like, like, more than I probably should be, but it looks really fun. And that's the main thing when you're making a game. It's going to be fun. Yeah, like, the, the art is what he's good at, you know? It, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's not the best art, but it has a lot of personality. And then, like, the mini games and stuff, he just... 
there's just so much personality that it doesn't matter if everything's made in MS Paint. Right, exactly. That's pretty much all that you need. I mean, it's not like, you know, a, a lot of games have to have something super fancy. Off is mostly black and white with stock images and here, here and there with some characters. I mean, it's three of your party members are literal circles. But, <laughs> um, no, I mean, that's you've got that personality. Um, you've got enough thing to pull the player into to want to play. That's that's pretty much all you need. Yeah, a spiffy title doesn't hurt either. Okay, now to the Yanfly stuff, because we've got to cover Yanfly every single cast. Uh, so Yanfly has a lot of new tips and tricks. Another news, Yanfly has died. Um, I'm very <laughs> sorry to tell you this. Um, Yanfly uh, contracted uh, Mega AIDS and died while, while he was on a trip to Peru. So no more Yanfly for, for us. <laughs> Man, then who's making all the videos? That's Yonfly's ghost. <laughs> Maybe he figured out how to become a lich. I think that Yonfly just, uh, he programmed a script to create other programs. <laughs> he, like, created an AI to create videos and more scripts. Yeah. That feel when Yonfly invented Skynet and never told anybody? <laughs> uh, I believe it. It'll be really hard to get him on the podcast, then. That's true. Let's have a um, moment of silence for the recently departed Yonfly. <laughs> wow, that is so disrespectful. <laughs> I can't believe you right now. <laughs> a very important member of our community has died, and you're a you're acting like this is some sort of joke. I don't know what to think anymore, man. You should think, boy, howdy, I'm going to go... And purchase a copy of Dashboard on Steam. That's that's a really good <laughs> decision on your part. But I've, I've made that decision already. Mm. I can't do it again. I, I guess I could buy it for somebody. Yeah, yeah. And if you've already done it, the correct train of thought is, hey, I'm going to go buy another copy of Dashboard for my buddy. <laughs> and then another one. And oh. just keep buying copies for everyone you know. Yeah. <laughs> Tell your friends about Dashboard. Get your friend's Dashboard. Get your friend's friend's Dashboard. Give your friend's baby's Dashboard. Okay. All right. You, you've hit what? that. Thank you for that commercial car. Back to the show. Dashboard. Off of Yanfly, back to Yanfly. He made a comic about a month ago talking about, let's make a game. And I really appreciate how basically he advocates you do town dungeon rinse, repeat, you know, you work on just the, the basic elements instead of having this grand scope that you try and uh, reach out to. You know, I think that people's reach should be, uh, let's see, what the hell is it? Is it reach or grasp that needs to be longer? A man's reach should exceed his grasp, I think, Thank is you. the quote. Yeah, so you always want your imagination to be capable of more than you personally are. Um, and I think Yanfly's comic gives you tools to increase your grasp on the program and allows you to uh, figure out some ways to streamline the process for when you actually want to make your dream game. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, too, because actually I like to just read it before this uh, this podcast. So one thing that I really found similar to it, I don't know if you, if there's any writers out there listening, but if you're familiar with the Snowflake method for writing, it's very, very similar. For those of you who aren't, Snowflake method is basically you write one sentence to describe your entire book, break that up into five sentences for a paragraph, take each sentence, break that out into a paragraph, repeat ad nauseum. <laughs> How about the uh, special snowflake way of writing? That That's where you just, what, what fucking Ralph did in the comic, where you just start at the beginning and you go to the end and then paint yourself into a corner, be damned. Self. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, just that, that kind of idea where you, you put, you have the skeleton done first and then you, you know, add meat onto the bones, as it were, is a very good way to do it. I've never actually considered applying that, that I do for writing, to game making, but I might now, because that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it, I did something similar when I started Defeat the Darkness, because I bought a lot of books on writing, and one of them that I, I straight up devoured was Screenplay by Sid Field, and that's about like writing screenplays for film, but what it taught me was the index card method, where you write down all the major plot events on index cards, 
you rearrange them in a way that makes sense, and then you string yourself from one to the other to the other, you know? So you have these big events that need to happen, and you can get from point A to point B any way you want. Mm -hmm. It kind of turned into, we have to go save the princess, Adam can't fall in love with the princess, why? Okay, now that's an important plot point, I have to keep remind, I have to remind myself of it later, she betrays us. Okay, why? You know, and then just work out everything in between. It works, though. Yeah. So if you're listening and you have an idea for a big, grand RPG, I would advocate that. Just write down all the important plot events, and then you have them right in front of your face. And you can ask yourself, do they make sense? You're not, you know, brainstorming it. You're not having everything just swim in your head all at once. You have them down concrete, and you have that sort of baseline. And then if something doesn't work, you take that index card and you put it in a little folder called For the Sequel. <laughs> okay, that's better than to take that index card and throw it in the trash, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I expected you to say. Okay, now I like that a lot better. <laughs> yeah, and if I also did a bunch of tips and tricks... Um, I really like both Entrust and Daring Padawan. So Entrust is pretty simple. You transfer all of your TP from the caster to an adjacent ally. And then uh, Daring Padawan is where a character starts with a lot of buffs. And if they get critted, they lose a buff. But if they kill somebody, they gain them all back. Um, the first one, I feel, kind of plays to the Bravely Default crowd, where it's all about strategy and managing all of your little points and flipping them between your allies. And then yep. the Daring... The, the Daring Padawan one is more kind of character-based, where, you know, each of your characters has special things that they do, and the gameplay is augmented by the character's personality. See, something like that, I'm not really sure, because it kind of depends on how important critical hits are for something like that in a game. Because if you ever... The crits aren't, like, something that happen a lot. It's just basically free stat buffs. <laughs> Was yeah. my was my thought when I looked at it, but yeah, as long as crits are prevalent in your game, no, that's that'd be actually a really interesting mechanic. Yeah, I think what would also make it really cool is, especially since it's Star Wars, you have like everyone has a beef with somebody, Darth Toaster or whatever. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, are you disrespecting on Darth fucking Toaster right now? <laughs> in the Star Wars expanded universe, Darth Toaster is is a really good uh, character and. He escapes the Sarlacc pit. He, he's good. <laughs> Air disrespect on Darth Toaster unless you want to lose your life. Okay. So let's say Darth Toaster had a beef with this Padawan's father, okay? So, obviously the Padawan's going to hate him. Darth Toaster is probably going to end up hating the Padawan later in the story. And if you have characters that hate each other, maybe they have an increased crit chance. Mm, I can dig it. Because if you're going to add your story to the gameplay, don't half-ass it. Like, do these characters know each other? How? You know, what's their what's their dynamic? I could also see it as, like, suppose your character is a mage, and eventually they have to fight the person that trained them. Well, either they're scared, or the wizard, you know, knows everything they trained the apprentice, so they gain a natural resistance to everything that they cast. Like, someone else in the party could have the same spells, but they were trained to do them a different way, and therefore does normal damage to this guy, whereas... The Apprentice wouldn't. Yeah, I like a lot of little stuff like that. Of course, you've also got to have a way for your character to, you know, be effective in that fight somehow. But just, yeah, little little things like that to add those little touches of character is super important. Mm -hmm. You know, next time I make a game, I'm going to do that. I'm going to make it very small and character focused because after working on Defeat the Darkness for so long, there's a lot of things because, you know, everyone gets they get a shit ton of ideas while they're working on the game they're working on. Right. And I want to just make, like, small experimental games now. It's like, can I make this work? And how long can I stretch this gimmick before it gets boring? You know? Right. Yeah, I did the, the first a lot. Like, can I do this? And then I did, and then I did it, and I'm like, cool. <laughs> that, was the, that was the end of it. <laughs> I didn't actually like, try to make it into anything. It was just, can I do this with events? I can. Excellent. Time to file that away and probably never use it. Woo! <laughs> Okay, guys, my uh, internet's going completely out, so I think I'm going to have to go. <laughs> All right. Well, well, thank you so much for trying, Carb. Oh, bye. See ya. Poor Carb. All right. Poor internet. I'm not going to back down like, like last year. We're just going to keep going. Okay. This, this is not going to be fucking hiatus 2.0. No, I would rather have a good solid half hour than nothing. That's what we're doing this time. 
Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm ready. All right. So our theme today is quest design in RPGs. And what I mean by that, because I've wanted to talk about this for a while, but it's been very hard for me to distill it into a sentence or two that, that makes a lot of sense. But what I want to do with quest design is most RPGs are walking around and pressing A. And people have been walking around and pressing A for about 30 years, unironically, enjoying themselves. People have also been staring at words, unironically, for about 400 years. It's called reading. Um, so, yep. so what separates good quests from bad ones? What makes a game compelling and what keeps a player coming back? How this really started was I looked at all the RPGs that I have in my house and I started going through, okay, well, I never finished that one. Why didn't I finish that one? I never finished that one. Why didn't I finish that one? And then I also thought about games that I did finish and why, because there are games like Final Fantasy VII and Suikoden II that I just, I, I played for a while and then never got back around to. And then there's stuff like Fallout 3, which I'll admit isn't the greatest game, but for some reason I felt compelled enough to get all the way through. I think that starts with Fallout 3 especially. You're never truly lost. Even though it's an open world game, every time you boot it up, it tells you what the next plot event is going to be. And then you can go, mm -hmm. oh, so I have to go to the DC Ruins, or I have to go to the Radio Tower, or I have to go kill my father. And then you're like, okay, so we'll, we'll think about doing that, but in the meantime, I, I'm free to do whatever I want. Yeah, and it's interesting, because that's one thing I was going to bring up too, that not all those really big open world traveling games have, is, if I remember right, Fallout 3 has a fast travel too. So you can always just, even if you're not really sure where you are, because I remember I did stop it for a little while and then I booted it up and I was just, I was literally in the wilderness and I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing here. <laughs> um, but, but I was able to like fast travel to where I was supposed to go or like back to a town that I've recognized, kind of get my bearings, look over my gear, go like, oh yeah, this is the character I built. Okay. And then I was <laughs> able to like actually proceed from there. So having a fast travel in those big, big games like that is super helpful to kind of get your bearings a little bit but yeah in a lot of games that's not uh that's not really present in any capacity mm -mm. and then you have like grand theft auto which is a sandbox game and more usually people don't play it for the plot you're just playing to fart around <laughs> yeah like yeah like you're gonna have fun getting to wherever the hell you need to go yeah the other thing is like uh w with pokemon you know people give linear rpgs a lot of shit but to the credit of linear RPGs, you know exactly where you're going next, because there's where you were, and there's where you're going. Mm -hmm. uh, Pokemon status screen shows you which gym leaders you've defeated. So you can just look and go, oh, so this guy's the next one on the list. Well, fuck this guy, we're off to get our badge. Right. And then if you have all the badges, well, then obviously you need to beat the Elite Four. And I trust people to know whether or not they've beaten the Elite Four, and then the end game begins, and you're just wandering around doing whatever you want. Yeah, if uh, <laughs> if you're Robin, you're uh, doing competitive breeding for like three months, <laughs> or however long it was, Christ. But no, I, I mean it, it works. It's a it's a tried, tested, and true formula. It's not like anything incredibly innovative, but it works. You know exactly what you expect going into the game, and you get exactly what you want out of the game, more or less. Yeah. That works as well for kids as it does for very busy adults. And I think there's starting to be less of a line between them because both kids and busy adults have short attention spans. So, That's true. So you have to breed reward into your system as quickly as possible so people don't go, why am I turning this system on again? All right, Pokemon. Oh, what am I doing in Pokemon? Okay, cool. And you answer all those questions and get the action going as quickly as you can. Right, whereas with, with other games, um, you know, going back to where you mentioned Final Fantasy VII, if you're just on the overworld and you turn it back on after, like, even a month or two, you're just going to, like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was chasing Sephiroth, I remember that. And then, <laughs> and then you look at the screen for a minute, and you're like, eh, I'll, I'll go play Pokemon. <laughs> and then you turn it off. Yeah, uh, I was talking with Red Mage before the podcast. We were going over games that we 
hadn't finished. And I never finished Final Fantasy VII because I got to the part like where you get the Bronco and you're flying around and then you get shot down. So you're like paddling this crashed plane around the overworld. And I ended up in Wutai, which you're not really supposed to find till disc two, but I was so damn lost. I went all the way around the world and I found Wutai before I found whatever the hell else I was supposed to be doing. And that's, yeah, and that, and that happens to a lot of people. Um, that's like the one area of the game, because I can go, I've played it enough times, I can pretty much tell you exactly where you need to go on every single, like, plot point, except for that one. <laughs> <laughs> because when it happens, and it's like, okay, you need to go here, and then the plot happens again. But I don't, I don't even now, I have no idea where that here is. I just, I don't remember. <laughs> Everywhere else, as soon as you tell me something else, oh, yeah, you need to go here next. That spot? No idea. <laughs> okay, okay. So I blew up the Midgar reactor. Where do I go now? Which which reactor did you blow up, though? You, you blew up two. Okay, what's the first one you blow up? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> God, because I want to say reactor seven, but I don't actually know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's looking to mine first as well, and I'm like, you know... No, don't you start with five? Mm. I think it's five. <laughs> God. Maybe five is like, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Um... We ran into some common problems, you know, like FF7, you just you just get lost, you don't know what to do. Something that I want to bring up with, like, the grinding episode that we never actually made, RIP, is, uh, so Final Fantasy Legend 1 and Legend 2, I, like, I beat Legend 3. I beat it a long time ago, back when I was playing these on an original Game Boy. But FFL 1 and FFL 2 have what people call a beef gate, where you must be this level or your ass is going to get stomped into the ground. Okay. And FFL2, there's a part, like, way in late game where you are in Legally Not Japan, where people are smuggling <laughs> Legally Not Cocaine, because this is a kid's game. And right. Yeah, because it's bananas. So your party's duty, 90% of the way through the game, is to stop an illegal banana smuggling operation. And the boss there has an ability called Tornado, which takes out, like, 500 HP. The max is 999. Do you see where I'm going with this? Uh, if you're not, uh... <laughs> At 500 or more, you uh, you get one hit KO'd, and that's the end of your little adventure. <laughs> yes! Oh, goodness. <laughs> I'm dealing with a smart one here. Yeah, so what ended up happening to me in FFL 2 was I had to level up, but because you're at the end of the game, and they totally botched the scaling for FFL 2, so the farther you are in the game, the harder it is to level up. And if you don't have up-to-date equipment, you can't fight up-to-date enemies, so you can't even level up properly, so you have to go back to the first world and get a shit ton of money, and blah blah blah. So I just game sharked it. I just game sharked it like three, four years ago and beat the damn game. <laughs> I mean, it works. Sometimes you have to for those. That, that or play remakes, one of the two. Yeah. The, the other one is like, uh, there, there are games that they're still building stuff up. So there's nothing really to latch on to. So like both with uh, with Tales of Symphonia, I was sick from work for like a week. And the only thing I could do was play GameCube and lay down and eat soup and then sleep. So I had Tales of Symphonia on. I was playing it, had a really good time. And then like I was, I'm at some, some temple where there's like a waterfall and I saved and I quit. And it's like, what the fuck was I supposed to be doing here? These enemies are annoying. Why can't I go home? <laughs> and... <laughs> And so I just never thought to pick it back up, because, like, I lost the incentive, especially, like, I got some kind of gem that lets me upgrade somebody's skill, but because we're still in the early 2000s with Tales of Symphonia, it didn't tell me what using that gem on any of the characters would do, so right. once I used it, it was lost, but so fuck you, I'm gonna have to look it up now. <laughs> right. With Tales of Symphonia, I ha we had a similar experience. I say we, because the only reason I ended up playing that game is because it was multiplayer, as far as, like, the battles went. Mm -hmm. So me and three friends, like, played, and we all voice acted our own characters <laughs> while, <laughs> while the game was going on, and we took turns with NPCs. I mean, it was a blast, but then, like, when we, like, all moved away, we never finished it. Oh. So, like, like, one day I have to go back and play, but I just remember, there, did you get to the, the little girl... That was like a robot or something. She has a giant axe. She's great. Oh no, I didn't get to her. Oh okay, she's great. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> get to her if if you ever go back. Uh, anyway, continue. Sorry. Uh, did, were you voicing her? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, but, but because she was a robot, I just did it in like the most monotone, like deep, manly voice possible. It was <laughs> wonderful. Executing command. 
kill all humans. Yeah, I mean, the axe that she wielded was, like, bigger than she was. Like, she was phenomenally overpowered strong. She was slow as shit, though. But <laughs> Pr Prisea, that was her name. Mm. Very pretty name for a very robot girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's probably where the tiny girl with big weapon meme came from. It might have been. God. Just like the... Uh... The other one that, that, that drives me nuts is, like, the little blonde girl with the twin pigtails who is secretly a vampire and is, like, 4,000 years old. Yeah. The, and it's... The, the lolly vampire. Yeah. yeah. And it's always a little blonde girl with twin tails. It's never not. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. It, it That, yeah. That's pretty, that's pretty accurate. I watched, uh... Some some anime recently, and this girl showed up, and I'm like, I bet she's a vampire. She was a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> it was just kind of like, that is, that's, that's sad. She's got blonde hair, she's got twin tails. That's literally all I had to go off of, and I called it. <laughs> God. I, I wonder when uh, anime tropes will just start eating at themselves. You know, you don't know who's trolling who, or if it's actually genre-defying when everyone's doing that and the opposite of that. Right. And just become such a clusterfuck. I'm I am ready. <laughs> I'm ready for that. Oh god. Another one that, that I was playing a lot and then dropped was a Shadowrun Returns. And this isn't this isn't like a dig at Shadowrun Returns, but like when I when I booted it up I started playing it. I had a lot of fun. Like I liked the engine, I liked the combat, I liked the dialogue, I liked all the stuff. But you kinda notice like there's all these little dialogue choices and you know Usually I'm a perfectionist. I want to get, like, the perfect result every time. But for this, I realized, okay, you know, no big deal. I'm not going to talk the guy out of shooting himself. That's fine. But I played for nine hours straight. I saved and quit. And I have yet to turn the game back on. <laughs> you know, I did so much in that nine hours. I don't remember who my character is, what I'm supp right. supposed to be doing. I, I think I beat the first area and I'm supposed to be moving on to the next one now is where I officially stopped. Gotcha. I, that, that's one of the the many games that we talked about before that I don't I don't think that uh, I've played at all. Like I played Shadowrun Tabletop and I played the Super NES and the Genesis <laughs> Shadowrun games, <laughs> but uh, not the uh, not the new one. So it's... I can't comment on there. Uh, has there ever been a game where like you just you overdosed and then just never went back? Um, the only game I've ever really overdosed on was uh was Dragon Guard for PS2. Um. Because I, me and a friend started playing it. Uh, we like picked it up randomly at uh, GameStop, went home, played, and then literally like that night we started sleeping in shifts, like 100%ing the game. <laughs> so, to be fair, once we beat it, I have never turned it on again, <laughs> and I probably never will. Oh jeez. If we ever do a, a proper grinding episode, I'm going to talk about Dragon Warrior Three for Game Boy Color. Oh uh, hell yeah. Yeah, because Dragon Warrior 3, it had a lot of collectibles. It had oh yeah, it had the tiny medals, it had the monster medals, it probably it had the Pachisi boards, it had a bunch of, of shit you could do. Um, mm -hmm. And you needed to collect gold, bronze medals, to collect silver medals, to collect gold medals, and there were certain places where you could refight bosses if you didn't get their medal the first time, blah blah blah, yada yada. Um, so anyway, you beat the game, and there's a wish dragon, and he grants wishes. And one of the wishes... Like, every time you fight him, he, get, he gets harder and harder. So the proper way to beat the Wish Dragon stuff is to wish to fight him again so that he'll, you'll keep fighting him and then unlock the Monster Metal Dungeon and do all that extra stuff. Well, I wish to fight him again. I got, like, the first bonus dungeon, which is not the Monster Metal one. I got through that bonus dungeon. I beat the crap out of him then. And then I looked online at Game FAQs. I saw the guides. I saw every optimum strategy for getting these monster medals and refighting all these guys and what my party needed to do, what level they had to be at, what spells were great. Yep. And I said, yep. fuck this shit. Yep. I, I wished for my dad to come back to life, <laughs> which is the stu it's the stupidest wish. It's the absolute stupidest wish because yeah. all, all that happens is you can go back to your town, there's your dad, and he says, hi, how's it going? And then I shut yep. off the game. <laughs> like... that, that, that sounds about right. No, I, I I like the idea of of like virtually infinite progression and that kind of thing and optional stuff and unlocking and all that. But that sort of shit right there is the same reason that um, 
I don't really get into the like the Fire Emblem games where it's like, all right, so you have to use these stat boosters on these characters at these times. You have to waifu this particular girl so that your <laughs> child has these stats. Or rather, you have to play a girl so you can be with this guy so your child has these stats. <laughs> you know, and it's like I don't. I don't care that much. I just want to. I just want to play the game with the people I want to play with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that should be the end of it. Yeah, like, so I talked about this a while ago. Like uh, I played Final Fire Emblem Seven, which is like the OG GBA Fire Emblem in the U.S. Um, yep. Raven ended up being my guy because Raven kicks ass. Um, I heard about like Nino being you know the little girl that has really good stat growth, so you want to you know make get her involved so she'll be a total kick ass mage. Don't do that to yourself. Just, just fucking don't. You know, Pent is overpowered. The second you saw Pent on the field, you knew he was overpowered. Just fucking use Pent. Nino ain't <laughs> worth the fucking effort. Oh yeah. my god. And I found it. I didn't, I haven't posted it anywhere because I forgot until now, but I told, last time I said this on the podcast, like, I will show you my saves because I have all ten save states in my emulator with different rounds of Fire Emblem on them. <laughs> like, like I have right before I start the battle, you know, I click the button and then nine separate turns. And, and basically it was just me manipulating the RNG pool. Cause it's like, okay, so I just killed this guy and got no stat ups and I'm really pissed. So I'm going to end my turn instead. He's definitely going to miss his next attack and we're going to try this all again. Yeah. No, I, yeah, because it was, uh, I played Sacred Stones recently, and Sacred Stones has the arenas in there, which are great. Um, <laughs> be, and now, theoretically, you can just save your game, go to the arena. If you're gonna, if your character's gonna die, you just turn off the game, you turn it back on, and you reload your save. Yada, yada, yada. So eventually, I was just like, okay, that's really no different than using save states, which is just faster. <laughs> so, because there's like four characters in there that have like apprentice classes, and then when they hit level 10, they graduate to a normal class. So they get 10 more stat levels than everybody else. So I just leveled those guys. <laughs> and there's one, one, one girl who was awful, Amelia was her name, when I got her, and then she basically just ended up being an unstoppable force of destruction <laughs> by the end of it. And I pretty much sold the rest of the game with her, so... Uh, Amelia's but, like that armored knight with the spear, right? Yeah, only like her sprite, she's like really thin and really frail, and she has like a stick rather than a spear. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. She, yeah, she's the one. She is overpowered as all hell. I love her. God. I, I remember reading some comics, it was like, Amelia, what are you doing? I'm getting huge. What? Huge! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty accurate. Like, she, she started out really bad, and then just the more I used her, just it stopped like really being much of a challenge and I'm sure there, and there was a post game and there's all these other stuff you have to do. But then again, it goes back to, you have to do these specific things, with these specific characters, specific times to get the best result. And I'm just like, eh, I don't care that much. <laughs> right. But when it comes, but when it comes to, if we ever talk about plot, I'm going to come back to that game because I have a huge gripe with, with Sacred Stones. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll do that now then since we're getting into how grinding and, and super perfect power gaming sucks. And I'll complain about Final Fantasy Tactics Advance another day. Um, okay. I had a couple people in our crew play Final Fantasy Legend 1, which, despite being a spinoff, is the first Final Fantasy title to sell over a million copies. It's very dated now, especially the combat system and how slow the combat can be. But the way its world is designed, I feel, is really, really great. And we're going to get into that right now. So Final Fantasy Legend 1 starts. You start as a character of your choosing. You can either be a... a so you can be a mutant or a human, and they can be male or female, or you can be a monster. And they have their own different gameplay mechanics. And then you don't just pick three more people. You have to go to a guild and hire more. So already... The game kind of defines who you are and what you're doing. You get to kind of develop who these other people are that you're hiring. Um, once you get your little group, you leave where the tower is, you go to the first town. It's really simple to find because you basically walk off a bridge and then go south. And boom, there's the one town. And everyone in there tells you that there's three kings. There's King Shield, King Armor, and King Sword. And... Lo and behold, right next to that town is King Shield, and all of his guards tell you to get the hell out, and if you go up to him, he says, I'm not giving my shield to you. But also in that town, there are people that talk about where King Armor is. And King Armor is generally the, the second one you find, because he has his own little quest. He wants you to basically convince this girl to marry him. 
when you go find her, she says, I would love to, but the Bandit King says that he'll sack my town if I do. So then you go kill the Bandit, you save the girl, they get together, and King Armor gives you his armor. Now that you have King Armor's armor, the game doesn't tell you where King Sword is, but it's a Game Boy game, the map is small, you eventually find King Sword. With King Armor's armor, you can take King Sword's sword pretty easily, you take King Sword's sword, then once you have both, you go back to King Shield, you find out the King Shield is dead, his advisor killed him, wants to pin it on you, you kill him, take his shield, and then you move on to the next world. I feel that the game was very properly built, especially with that first world, because it puts everything in a place that makes sense. You're never truly lost, and you always have like an idea of what you want to do. Like The game doesn't tell you that you have to go to King Armor first. It is the smart move. It is probably the more exciting move, but if you want to go for King Sword, well, you're free to wander around the map until you find his castle. Okay, I didn't think about that no i just kind of followed the natural progression of the game when i played so yeah i went to the the town because the people in the first town told me about what was like south town was like actually the name of it it's like directly (laughs) south of you Mm -hmm. um and so no i went there and then yeah found out about about the bandit and found out about the other king and everything so i'm like okay well i kind of figured out pretty much everything i need to know just from talking to npcs and so i just kind of followed the game now i did beat the bandit guy he wasn't really that hard. Okay. Wait, I got to talk about my team, though. I, I mentioned this before. Okay. Yeah. So I read, I don't want to say like a guide, but I basically read an overview of the three races and what they do. And so I realized that humans get like items to stat up. Mutants, they get set ups after battle. So you can kind of like niche their roles. And then the monsters can turn into other monsters or some some shit. I don't know. Yep. Um, that, I thought that was really cool. So I played as a monster first, and I died because you're really weak <laughs> as a monster. <laughs> it's, like, really hard. Plus, I didn't recruit any party members, so my first attempt was a total bust. <laughs> um, but then I just went in with four mutants, and I had two guys that did attacks, and I had two guys who did magic. And so by the time I got to sword, like... Because there's all these fucking enemies that show up in groups, and my magic was pretty close to just wasting the entire groups altogether, because mutants are great. And if I ever play that, if I continue playing it, I guess all the way through, I'm just gonna keep running with four mutants. <laughs> Fuck all the other races. <laughs> but no, it was it was very because it wasn't linear because it was open. You could make the choices that you wanted to make, but you had a limited number of choices to do. It wasn't just here's the whole world. I mean, you know, the, the three kings are on this particular continent, but you can go to these other continents if you want, because there's no real point to do that. So instead, they just remove that choice from you and just make, you know, narrow the scope of the game to something that you can digest. Yeah, I, I really like that, that kind of semi-open system where you're on the first floor of the tower, and these are the places you can go. Once you complete that area, you can go up to the next couple floors and find the new world, and again, you're still free to roam wherever you want, but the plot will, you know, kind of guide you in certain ways. You know, it's it's open, and then it's not. It's got a good sense of structure without being too linear. Yeah, and I think that's definitely a good way to do it, and something that I, a lot of other early RPGs did as well. Dragon Warrior, <laughs> when it first came out, before it was Dragon Quest, kind of had that. They basically were just, but they had the... Uh, the muscle gate or whatever that you were talking about before. Cause you talked to the talents. You were like, yeah, whenever you cross a bridge, monsters are a lot harder and you're like, okay. And then you go across the bridge and then you get just annihilated. <laughs> because They're a lot harder. So the game, it kind of forced you to play within the confines without actually locking you off. Final fantasy two did that too. Only there weren't bridges. Monsters were just randomly stronger sometimes. And then you just died. So, oh God. so yeah. No, I love Final Fantasy 2, but it is a, like an awful game design. No, but that kind of idea where you have... The scope is just limited to what you can do, and there's enough little variation that you could, you know, if you wanted to grind up to get King's Sword first, then come back and kill your Bandit King. <laughs> I imagine you could do that, and then just decimate the rest of the game at that point. Yeah. Well, up until you, you know, until you get rid of the sword anyway. Yeah. What the hell is I going to say? Oh, God. Oh, yeah. So, the reason the monsters are so weak is because they are the monsters you're fighting. Like, quite literally, it's like Pokemon, where the monsters in your party are the exact same strength as the monsters you are fighting out there. And if you want to, when you go to the guild, you can recruit goblins, and they have 20 HP. So, you have a party member with 20 hit points to start the game. Yep. Which is not that many. 
No. The whole barrel of fun. Uh, normally when I play, I go two mutants, a human, and a monster. Uh, so I have a good variety, and then I don't have humans eating up all my all my funds, because that the game is grindy enough. I'd rather the, you know my mutants level up on their own than having to spend money on them. <laughs> right. Yeah, the the only thing that I I guess miss is not the real the good word, but the problem I have is I have like half the inventory space <laughs> that I should because humans get like the maximum mutants get a very limited amount, so Yeah. And if you want to wear armor and a helmet, you know uh... Nah dude. I'll, I'll just kill everything before it kills me. That's how I play my games. <laughs> the best defense. Is an overwhelming offense. <laughs> Another thing, just uh, FFL1 really hooks you from a narrative standpoint as well, because you're given enough, you know, because it's Game Boy, they can't fit a whole lot of text in there, but you get a very strong idea of who everyone is just based on what you have on screen. FFL also was not shy in using all of its sprites, so, like, King Shield looks like an old skeleton. Now, you can either imagine him to be a skeleton monster because there's a lot of monsters roaming around in towns that you can just talk to because they're NPCs and, you know, monsters in your party. So the, the world of F FFL has a lot of sentient monsters that do adventures for a living. Or you can imagine him as a very old man, much like a skeleton, you know, mm -hmm. just clutching to a shield and not wanting to die. Also, King Armor either has some weird fetishes or he just he just likes the octopus girls. I don't know. <laughs> I'm probably both. <laughs> I thought that too. I, I wasn't sure if you were going to want to talk about that, but okay. I'm <laughs> glad you brought that up. Yeah, because it it's very interesting. You because you talk to King Armor first. No one ever goes to that village first. They all go to King Armor first, and he says, mm -hmm. "Oh, there's this girl I really like, and I wish that we could get married, and you should convince her, and I'll give you anything." And so you're like, okay, cool. So you go down there, and you're expecting some mix of 16 by 16 pixels to be a beautiful girl. But no, it's a squid village, and it's a squid girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that alone makes it compelling. And then she talks about the Bandit King and all that. And I think the Bandit King himself, is he a skeleton or a lizard? I forgot which. I remember him being a lizard. I'm pretty sure that's what he was. Okay. That's what he looked like to me. Well, yeah, because it's like the alligator sprite. Yeah. Yeah, there was there's just a lot of skeletons in the cave. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so so Bandit King himself is a giant alligator. <laughs> and then you kill him dead. Um, my favorite part of that whole thing. So, like, you get the girl. The girl goes up to King Armor. And one of your characters says, you promise to say anything. And he's like, mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm can either be interpreted as he's looking at his lover's eyes and going, mm-hmm, you know, as if he forgot. Or he's like, oh, fuck, mm-hmm. <laughs> It's like, oh, yeah, I guess I did, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, uh, th this goes a little bit more into world building, but the takeaway from all of this is the following. King Shield is an asshole and wants to keep his shield. King Sword has no guards. It's just a castle full of monsters, and, and King Sword literally just starts attacking you. Yeah, King... he's badass. Yeah. King Armor welcomes you to his castle, asks you for a favor, willingly gives up his armor. Guess which one of those three is still alive when you leave? <laughs> yep. Just Mr. Armor. That's King Armor to you, asshole. <laughs> but, but yeah, so the moral of the story is, be nice. <laughs> yeah, don't be an asshole. Even yeah. though King Sword is my, my so far my tentative hero. <laughs> so far. Because yeah, there's no guards. He's just like, I'm badass enough, I don't need guards. You want to fight? Bring it on. And I'm like... I, I feel you, King Sword. <laughs> God. The next world is like an island world, and this is where FFL kind of takes the same formula and tweaks it a bit. Now, again, being a Game Boy game, exploring the whole world doesn't take a lot of time. So there, it's okay to put in, oh, there's an island, and it's kind of over here. And then you're like, are you fucking serious? That's all you're giving me? There's no map? But again, it's a Game Boy game, it's going to take you probably about five, ten minutes at most. Yep. You know, at, at most. So it's not like you're going through Final Fantasy VII in a crashed plane, paddling, trying to find the next location. <laughs> you know. Where there's literally an entire continent's worth of space to search. Right. And all of the oceans. It, no, it's localized. It's the, the, again, the viewpoint is smaller. 
Yeah, so they can put in that kind of stuff. And then uh, on the second world, there's a spot where like you have to get a seed that allows you to breathe underwater, and the guy tells you it's the middle tree. What, what the fuck you mean the, 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 the middle palm tree? Because, again, it's it's this fucking world with, that has palm trees. It's like a tropical kind of paradise sort of thing. <laughs> so then you're, you're going around on this little boat you found trying to find it, and then you find a, like a circle of trees with one in the middle, and you go, oh, okay. And then, you, and then you stand on top of it and press A and nothing happens because you have to face the tree. You can't stand on top of it. But, nice. <laughs> yeah. They tell this to you in a safe environment because your next objective is to go underwater and get the red orb. Um, the red orb is hidden with a bunch of very similar looking orbs that are all crabs. So if you click the wrong one, a crab attacks you. And because this is Game Boy, none of the orbs are actually red. They all look exactly the same, so you have to remember <laughs> um, where the two lines cross, which is another riddle in and of its own. So you're you're rewarded for talking to the NPCs because one of them says, remember where the two lines cross, and then you see in the dungeon line A, line B, and then a big effing grid of orbs, and you're like, oh! <laughs> I saw the first line of, of orbs, and I clicked on a random one, and I got attacked by a crab, and then I saw a second line... And then the third one is no less than, like, 60 of them. It's, like, 8 by 8. So your odds of finding it before dying to crabs are very small. But if you listen to that NPC earlier... Then right. You... Yeah. Also, the way to find out about the air seed is there's a guy that says, whatever you do, don't speak to that old man on the tiny island. And, and of course, to, to beat the game, you gotta go speak to the man on the tiny yep. island. <laughs> As, as per usual with most early games, whatever you don't, whatever you do, don't do X. Well, I'm going to go do X right now. You can't stop me. <laughs> yeah, and, and that breeds so much interest, you know, because the game isn't holding your hand. It's, it's giving you a world. It's giving you the illusion of other people. And here comes Robin. Oh, it is Robin. Hello. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Just, just keep talking. Okay. Yeah, um, you can just chime in whenever. Yeah, so... What... Oh, God. Only you two. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> uh, so, with FFL1, I really love that, because it gives you these people that aren't necessarily telling you the truth. They, they're they just normal people. And if you're a normal person, you aren't trusting the, the weird old man on the hut in the middle of nowhere. You know? Right. And I think we lost a lot of that with, like, 3D games, where you have the Valve-era beta testers, where... Originally, with, like, the end cave, if you kept going right, it would bring you back to the beginning. But if you went left, it would take you further in the cave. And someone got so confused by this, they took it out. There was also another game, it was either Morrowind or Deus Ex or something, where a door's locked and a guy tells you, yeah, you can't go in, it's locked. So then the playtester never went in the door to, you know, finish the rest of the game. And they never thought about, you know, entering a different way either. They're just like, well, I can't go in there. I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me of, uh... Alright, so, this is kind of an aside, but same, same kind of idea. But fr friends of mine and I have, like, developed a, like, a DBZ-based tabletop game. And there's that one point where... Like, there were people in a building. Like, all of the like the bad guys were holed up in this building and, like, the police were asking for help or whatnot. And so we're, like, we sit for, like, ten minutes trying to figure out, like, the best way to get in. And, I'm, and then I just kind of, like, stopped and I was like, wait a minute. I'm just going to blow the building up. <laughs> this is DPC. What the hell? <laughs> just that whole, you have to, like, narrow the focus down, but you also have to, like, be able to think outside the box a little bit, too. So, yeah. In those older games like that, that is one thing I really liked, is that because they were so limited and so small in scope, they came in much more easily digestible pieces. Because even, like, for example, in Final Fantasy 1, when you get the boat, which you do pretty early on, you can only go to, like, the inner sea. Which means there's, like, two new locations that are open for you. And that's all. It gives you that taste of freedom, but there's really not anywhere to go, really, <laughs> much at all. And you have to, you know, go back and explore and get, you know, find things. Then you find the dynamite to blow up the thing, and then you can go. Then you can actually start exploring. And by then, you've got enough understanding of the game and where things are in the inner sea that it's a lot less daunting than if they just open the entire world to you at the beginning. Yeah, 
that is a good point too because FF1 it gives you the illusion of freedom a lot. You know, cuz mm -hmm. when you get the boat, your choices are elf land and death. Yeah. But but you made the choice. You chose to go to death. And now you know where you'll die and you're like, oh, "I guess I better go to elf land." Yep. Or if you go to elf land first, you're like, "Okay, elf land's cool. There's a question here. What's over here?" "Oh, I'm dead." "Okay, back to elf land." Yep. <laughs> Which, which is kind of the Final Fantasy way early on of kind of gating that progress, which, unlike a recent game, <laughs> the, the Pokemon Sun and Moon, I know we talk about Pokemon every episode, it's a necessity. They very... Have you played it, Cody, at all, or no? Uh, no. Okay. They literally, and I'm not, like, speaking in, you know, whatever is here, literally gate your progress. <laughs> there is a gate that you cannot cross until you have beaten the gym leader. <laughs> or the gym leader equivalent in the in this game. Oh so if you want to go further, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> you're stuck in the area that you're in until you beat the uh, the trial master person. I forgot all the terminology already. That's a gym leader. <laughs> Fuck it. Um, once you beat the gym leader, then they open the gate for you. Which, it works because it's Pokemon. If it was any other game, it would just be like, what the hell? Even despite it being Pokemon, that still pisses me off. And the reason, oh, yeah. the, the reason is like, okay, so in FF1, there's no expectation of a bridge. They just build it after you kill Garland. Okay, cool. In in Pokemon, back in the day, it'd be like, yo, hip trainer, you just beat me. Here's my badge. This badge allows you to use Rock Smash. And you're like, cool. And then you break the rock and you move on. But in this yep. one, they take out all the... They cut out the middleman, which I, I understand why, but you build up 20 years of this expectation, so now we're not even getting to interact with our Pokemon or imagine them smashing the rock. You took all of that out. It's true. Because the, they replace all the HMs with rides, so like, for like strength, you basically... There's a Machamp that carries you in his lower arms, and then he pushes the big rocks in the upper arms. But it's not your Machamp. No. Instead of fly, you hop on a Charizard and it takes you somewhere. But it's not your Charizard. <laughs> um, and so that, like, that, I really liked the convenience of them because you didn't have to have HM mules anymore, which was nice. But it still, like, it took away some of that personal aspect that you had, the bonds that you had with your with your mons. Exactly. You know, that's that's part of any sort of RPG progression is the opening up of the world, the feeling that your party can do anything. And when you hand that over to someone else, you don't feel like you're the most powerful. You feel like you're somebody else's bitch the whole game. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Don't get me wrong, the game is still fun, but like that, those aspects really made it difficult to get into as much. But then again, I had a werewolf, and werewolf are like my favorite things literally <laughs> ever. So I was well, I was willing to sh set all that aside to just werewolf my way through the game. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, your your character can turn into a werewolf? No, but one of the one of the Pokemon you get is called Lycanroc, and he's just a werewolf. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> when, he, when he evolves, okay. he's awesome. I love him. Nice. Love him. I assume that was in the Moon version. Yeah, the <laughs> the Sun version turns into a very pretty wolf looking thing. I'm just like, hey. <laughs> now give me a fucking werewolf. <laughs> Yeah, let me let me rip some shit up. I think more RPGs need to do that. And like Adam had me play FF15 for a while, and I was looking on YouTube. I was trying my hardest to see if anyone had completed the game without getting the car because your car's in the shop, but you're free to roam. Like I was almost mm -hmm. off the continent before that, and then I ended up in a mine. And Adam's like, "You gonna go get your car and camp?" And like, why? <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. The whole objective is I'm supposed to drive my car through this area, but I'm I'm I got here on foot. It only took you know half an hour of walking. <laughs> right. But but no, I fast traveled back. I got I did the camping thing and I bonded with the people and then I got my car and I started you know playing Grand Theft Final Fantasy, driving around. But I wish that there was someone else, just one other person on this goddamn planet who didn't want the car and wanted to see how far <laughs> they could get without the car. <laughs> I'm sure somebody tried it. Oh. I, had to, I had to be somewhere, but yeah, that would be that would be excellent. <laughs> I, I have not yet played 15 because a friend of mine got it and he was like, "Yeah, they're like putting out a big patch at some point to fix a lot of stuff." I'm like, "Oh, well, then I'll just wait." <laughs> yeah. So I haven't, I haven't played it. I own it. I just haven't played it. <laughs> 
but I'm going to play it now without the car. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll keep you updated on how far I can get without the car. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope you get far enough to find the Frog of Legends. I don't know what that is. <laughs> that's, that's apparently something that everyone on the internet complains about for FF15. It's apparently like some sort of side quest or something where you have to find the legendary frogs. I think the issue is because, okay, you have a minimap, all right? Mm -hmm. But it only, like, marks out a specific area of the minimap, like a circle. The frog is somewhere in this area. But it's a frog, right? So, what the fuck? <laughs> it's not like a big frog. It's just a regular frog. It's the frog of legends because it's like a rainbow-colored frog, oh, right? okay. I guess it's like a lot of frogs and then they're like different colors and you're supposed to find them and for some reason I think the last one is really hard to find because everyone keeps complaining about that last one <laughs> nice it's probably a color that like blends in with everything and I don't probably. know fuck alright so now I have no car and frogs to look forward to I am I am hype <laughs> 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 Oh. You masochist. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Um, so, Robin, you said that you could get an idea of where the frog is, or no? Because, like, the area they're supposed to be in is, like, marked by a circle in the minimap, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. But, like, okay. that's... Like, the general area, they're somewhere around here. But, like, other than that, you're like, where the fuck is it? You have to, like, look for them visually or whatever. Oh, is See, the... and I'm okay with that. Sorry, no, go ahead. <laughs> is the circle like a square mile, or what? Like, what? How big is this circle? I have no fucking idea. <laughs> but like everyone, I everyone I read about this frog of legend thing, it's like, oh, I wish I had the superpower to find the last frog, <laughs> or like some some bullshit like that. Nice. Okay. But see, like I said, I'm I'm pretty okay with that because all right, I and this is kind of tying back into the whole like quest thing, because even. Mm. Oh wait, let me let me let me preface this. This is World of Warcraft I'm about to go into because I played <laughs> this game for over a decade. Of course. God, I'm so glad I don't play anymore. Anyway, when World of Warcraft first started, it was like, hey, you need to go get these rabbit anuses over here, and that didn't really tell you where. They're just like, oh, it's over here. <laughs> and then eventually, by the time I quit playing. The rabbit anuses were, like, glowing. <laughs> so, like, they were just... Anything that you needed to pick up sparkled. So you knew exactly where it was. There was, a, like, a location that was colored on your map. Anything you needed to pick up was sparkling. It was so obvious and so boring and just so just tedious at that point. Like, you didn't need to, like, do anything. The mm. game did it for you. And that's bullshit. And I'm <laughs> mad. <laughs> So the fact that in Final Fantasy XV I have to look with my own eyes to find a frog, I'm okay with it. I'm excited for this frog hunt. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. You do you, man. <laughs> yeah, because like, like we're talking about with Pokemon, it takes all the personality out of it. You know, like with, with EverQuest, I had a friend that a little bit older than you, RM, that, that played EverQuest back in the day, and like, mm. every single NPC, who are you? What's your job? You didn't just get yep. to type quest, you had to like make conversation with these people to make them like you enough to give you a quest. Yep. You have to go up to NPCs, target them, say hail, so they would talk to you. Yeah, no, that was that was cool as shit. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Also, I'm old, so <laughs> that's probably part of it. But I like, I like stuff like that. Back in my day, we worked for our meals, damn it! Back in my day, when you wanted to go into a dungeon, you drew the damn map. <laughs> Yeah. Granted, you got Uchern Odyssey where you still have to draw the map, and that game's pretty fun too, so. Yeah, that's that's about where I draw the line, because, like, Wizardry, okay? Like, Wizardry yeah. had, like, rotating teleporter mazes. Yeah. Like... Fuck that noise. Still love it. <laughs> Hate it, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, how much am I willing to put up with today? God. Yeah, there's games on, uh,. Going way off topic now, but on I I know they're on iOS and maybe on other things too. They're called Sorcerer. They're basically just like a like not a port, but like that same idea. They're really hard. I love I love playing them, but I cannot like get anywhere on those games. Really good. Mm. All right. Anyway, sorry. Okay, back to quests and and that kind of thing. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
I liked uh, Fantasy Star Online. I played the shit out of that when I was a little kid. It's the same thing as, like, uh, like Pokemon, where you know exactly what you need to do. Like, the gameplay is, is pretty repetitive, because once you pick the weapon you like and you learn the combo attack for it, they just need to know how many healing items you have, and then you're in the dungeon and you're good. But what dungeon do I need to do? Oh, the last one on the list. Okay, great. And uh, if you mm, really need help... Fair enough. If you really need help, there's the... I think he's the principal. He's not even the mayor. He's the fucking principal of the ship. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know. But anyway, he's like, oh, you need to go over here and do this thing. You're like, okay, cool. And there's, like, a little bit of uh, finding his daughter, Rico. But the game doesn't shove it in your face. Like, if you explore the map, you'll eventually find totems and stuff. And I forgot if the game ever actually properly hints that finding all the totems is how you unlock the final dungeon. But I was one of those guys that filled out the whole map anyway. Right. So, yeah, and another cool thing the PSO did was you only had like the four maps, but every time you started it, you'd be you'd start in a different spot, and the map's layout would change, you know, based on where you started and and the flow that it wanted you to take. So even though you're only doing these four maps, you're always tackling them in a different uh, direction. Hmm, that's interesting. It was really hard for it to be boring. Right. Yeah. Now, that's that's kind of something, too, as far as, like, to avoid repetition, Dragon Warrior Monsters, or Dragon Quest Monsters, like the first one, the premise is very basic. You go into a teleporter, you go down the levels, you fight the boss, you unlock the next teleporter. You go down, I mean, but all the levels are randomly generated. Every single map is different. Mm. So... It's different every time you go into the teleporter, which, if you're like me, and you spent most of a camping trip with your family playing your Game Boy instead of interacting with people, <laughs> <laughs> by, the end of, like, by the end of the game, like, I had some of the maps memorized. Like, I would show up in a certain spot, I would, like, unlock three or four sections of the map, and I'm like, oh, I know where to go. <laughs> I've been on this map before. But it was still a neat, uh, neat idea, but... Again, like the questing or the progression in the game was absolutely linear. You just went to the most recently opened teleporter, you clear it, and then that's that's next, you know, and you just keep going. And that's pretty much the entire game. And I fucking loved it. <laughs> Ate that shit up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what kind of tells me that quest markers aren't the devil, especially in like games with a lot of replayability, like Dragon Warrior Monsters, because I assume, much like PSO, you would go through old dungeons over and over again, right? Yeah, because each dungeon has different monsters in it, and so to get, like, the ones that you want, or if you have to combine certain things to get, like, the certain special monsters, you've got to farm up, <laughs> basically, these different monsters. Or if you get somebody new, you go back to one of the earlier ones and fight a little bit to level them up to, you know... 9 or 10, so they're able to at least withstand a fight or two in whatever current dungeon you're in. And so, yeah, you revisit a lot of things over and over again. Yeah, so, so that's where a quest marker comes in handy, is because, you know, if you want to advance the plot, this is where you need to go, but if you want to keep catching Pokemon or you want to level up the monsters that you have, then you just go fart around for a bit. And uh, Final Fantasy Tactics did that too. Like, there's a red dot on your map. This is where you want to go if you want to advance the plot. If you want to unlock a couple more calculator abilities, go to one of the green dots. That's also like with the, the first Suikoden, which I ate up. Um, there's a certain part where like you unlock the castle, the game kind of opens up a bit. But when you want to actually move the story forward, you go talk to your, your advisor. And he's like, are you ready to attack You know, so-and-so complex or so-and-so castle? Basically, are you ready to advance the plot now? Yes, and then off you go. And so right. whenever you're done farting around, you just go back to your castle, talk to the guy, and then you know, you're off to the races. Yeah, I don't I don't inherently hate like the quest marker mechanic. It works because like we kind of talked about earlier, ki you know, kids and busy adults have limited time, limited resources, limited attention span. So, to be able to just pick up a game, open it up and be like, "Oh, this is what I need to do next." <laughs> is extremely helpful in a lot of cases. Yeah. Uh Robin, th the question have I not typed this in Skype like 57 different ways? I was asleep, <laughs> damn it. But... I was no. asleep for all of it. Over the past two weeks, I've been telling you guys, next one is Quest Design, i.e., and then some overly long, complicated explanation. But, all right, fine, But, fine, but basically, okay. basically, like, Quest Design, as in, like, there are people who read books. 
for fun, unironically. All you're doing is staring at words. What compels you to keep reading? Video games are, you're walking around and pressing A. You know, what right. compels people to do that? You know, and especially like when people save and quit, what compels you to come back? Because I have so many games that I, I played and I played and I thought they were good. And then I save and quit and then I just never go back. Because I'm like, eh, whatever. All right. So what, what has been talked about then in, so that I don't double up on something we already passed? Uh, let me see. Fallout 3, Morrowind, Final Fantasy 7, Final Fantasy 6 to a lesser extent, uh, Final Fantasy Legend we talked to for a while, and then you came, you came in when we're talking about Final Fantasy Legend, so like everything after that you've already heard. So that's what we've... Alright, 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 okay. There was also like, uh, I played both Shadowrun Returns and Tales of Symphonia extensively, and then there just came a point where I just saved and quit and just never went back. It was like, what was I doing? Who was my character? Like, screw it. You know, the game didn't give me enough to come back to. Whereas, like, Fallout 3, not the deepest RPG I played, but every time I booted it up, it said, oh, this is what you need to do in case you forgot, or if that's, you know, what you were planning on. Like, oh, okay, cool, yeah. Mm. Kind of reminds me of Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest. Uh... <laughs> oh, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Like... Like, okay, man, I, I don't know. I, I never really played it myself, but I've heard from some from a friend of mine the horror stories of what the fuck are these NPCs talking about? Holy yeah. shit, I'm lost. What the yeah. fuck? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with all those. Okay, you're good. I thought you were going to, like, you know, try and talk good about it. There are people out there who unironically enjoy it. One of my best friends does, and I'm just like, you're wrong. And he's like, no, you're wrong. And that's, like, that's as far as we get. <laughs> but no, that's a very like, that's, yeah. That's how to do it. How, like, that's how not to do it. So continue. <laughs> like yeah, no, I don't know. Like, you talk to one NPC, just one out of this one town, I guess, and then he goes like, "Oh, you better pray at this cliff or something or other," and you have to go look at the corner, crouch on the ground, cry yourself to sleep until something happens for you, and like. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's because the translation was a lot better in Japanese, but uh God, that's funny. There's something about like old school gamers though, is that is like the least hard thing. Cause you ever hear of like the Tower of Druaga arcade game? Oh yeah. Every level after twenty is so goddamn obtuse, like use the pickaxe to dig off the map, or use the pickaxe to, to break these specific blocks, or walk around the map counterclockwise, making sure you pass over these five tiles. You know Oh holy shit. Cody, I have played Druaga though, and I will tell you, some of some of the some of the guide stuff is bullshit. <laughs> but like No, seriously, cause like Cause like you're, cause you need to get items to get stronger and stuff to get to go upstairs, right? Mm -hmm. But like some of them are like, don't get this chest. But like, no, don't get this chest. This is poison. And then the other ones like, no, don't get this chest, cause like it'll teleport you down a few floors. <laughs> and it's like, fuck. But you know what? At least the manual actually like said these things existed. Like I don't know about Simon's quest, but it's like, what the fuck are you doing? Oh, uh, shit. God. I would yeah, hate no. both equally, because they're, they're obtuse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Okay, there's there's a place in my heart for those kind of games. And I, and I will still play those kinds of games and enjoy them, but most of the time nowadays, I don't really have time to like sit and wonder and figure out what the hell I'm supposed to do. I would rather just have a game that is straightforward and that kind of thing. So as far as like quest design goes... And nowadays, um, it com it does come back to like determining what audience you're trying to make your game for. If you're looking to make your game for other like-minded individuals, like us here, and probably the majority of the people on RPGMP, uh, RPM, mm. RPGMG. Well, no, we're P, not oh, the P. Okay. Just, just yeah, just the just the general. <laughs> you heard it here first. You heard it here first, folks. We are P. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, m make sure that you don't have just extremely obtuse things, unless it's like an optional item that might make your life a little bit easier. Sure, that's fine. But don't make it, like, necessary to complete the fucking game. Yeah. We love RPGs and play a lot of them, and even we're sick of that bullshit. Yeah, let me, here, I mean, speaking of games that we, we've dropped here, let me pull up my, uh, 
my RPG Maker game list here, real quick. I'm, I'm just going to go through all these. Okay. I always sometimes monsters I beat. It was just a walking simulator with a narrative, plus I got to work a job killing cows, and that was pretty cool. <laughs> Artifact Adventure, old school as hell, so it was basically just a trip down memory lane. That's fine. Celia's Quest I'm still working on, still absolutely want to play, a lot of fun. I just haven't had a chance to get back to it. All right, now let's get into the bad ones. All right, Destiny Warriors, okay. I was actually, despite how much I hated this game, <laughs> because the narrative didn't make any sense. The characters didn't make any sense. <laughs> the whole thing was written by, like, probably a 12-year-old. If you made this game and you're listening out there, I'm sorry. <laughs> I did enjoy your game, but it was bad. <laughs> But I got to a point where you have to use, like, you can use some key item to do something. It was like to give you like more lore about the world. And I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. I tried to use the key item and it crashes the game. I quit at that point. <laughs> okay. Oh um, all right. La Labaronia. Labaronia, I have a love-hate relationship with because much like the, the title sounds, pretty much everything in this game is a labyrinth. The towns are labyrinths. The dungeons are labyrinths. Everything oh, is. Holy shit. The game itself is fun to a point, but and, and the second game had such potential and it was all squandered because it was so cliche. It was like you you just you went down a list at TV tropes, you picked out a handful and you made a game out of them, <laughs> and then you spun in some labyrinths into it. Okay, that's that's the game. Um, Legend of Mysteria, which is the prequel, dropped. Because you have no idea what the hell you're, you're in a school and you're trying to find like a murder mystery or you're something. Somebody died and you're trying to figure out who, but there's nothing to go on. There is <laughs> nothing at all to go on. You talk to people. I talked to everybody a whole bunch of times. I tried looking at a guide. I, I followed the guide for a little while. I'm like, okay, I think I know where to go. Got lost again. And no. All right. No. I quit. <laughs> like, like a right. freaking old school LucasArts adventure game, man. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Speak, I have, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute too. I got because there's a game I beat recently. It's not an RPG, but I want to talk about it because it's cool. Um, oh, okay. Millennium: A New Hope. Okay, there's like five Millennium games. I played the first one. <sighs> the oh, game is it's so it's so inconsistent. And here's my problem because you have you start as like a farm girl. By the end of the first game, you find this monk who's been training alone in these caves or this tumble, or fucking, I don't even remember where he was, he hits for, like, a fourth of the damage that you do. His, he's, he's useless. Like, abs <laughs> like without compare, useless, compared to the main character. All of the, the overworlds are very pretty, and well, well done, but there's, like, points in the game where you can, like, like, because the main character jumps, that's, like, her thing. She can jump really high. So, but, like, there's parts where you have to find these special boots to let you jump higher, but not, like, ten minutes later, there's these cliffs that you jump across, and she makes impossible jumps. Like, hundreds of times her own height jumps <laughs> to continue onward, and the game doesn't even, like, lampshade it. Never mentioned nothing. And I'm just like, I don't... I don't. <laughs> I don't. I beat the first game and dropped the rest of the series. Not going back. Skyborne dropped for a really long time because that fucking dragon boss. I went back and then I beat it the first time. I don't know what what my problem was. Game's okay. It's basic. It's it's pretty, which is probably the only reason I kept playing. And the main character is pretty okay, but it's all basic. But what the fourth character? No, fifth character that you get. It's a five character party. She blows everybody else out of the water in terms of being like good. Her magic does way more damage. Her attacks do way more damage. There's Literally no reason to have the rest of the party except for the healer. Like, I, those two just duo the game. I guarantee you that's somebody's waifu. Like, some dev oh, put sure. his waifu in the game. God, yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure it is. But no, that was just, that was awful. Okay, but no, the, uh, the game I wanted to talk about that was, that was fun, and it, was, and, it, and it is an adventure game. It's called Finding Teddy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which I thought it was a I thought it was a platformer about a like a little girl trying to find her bear. Turns out it's like a uh, just like a point and click adventure that's very very I don't know like happy I guess. And then it's got like a musical over theme. You make friends with the big bad at the end. Um, it's a very cute little game, but I played it come and I kept coming back to it like whenever I had breaks from work. There's like very little dialogue because it's all done through song. There's 26 notes, which <laughs> equates to each letter of the alphabet. So 
when people say hello, it's, you know, they play like that song. Um, so it's very cute in that, in that kind of aspect, but the, the want to proceed, and this is kind of, I'm tying it back into our, our topic here. <laughs> <laughs> the want to proceed and find out what happens next. That's what kept me coming back. I did not know the character. I don't know her name. I don't know anything about her, but the fact that she was willing to go into this magical fucking world in her closet to fight, well, not fight, but make friends with, I guess, giant wasps and crocodiles and other certain things, going through all this just to get her teddy bear just said a lot about her as a character. <laughs> um, and, just, and just being able to see how things progressed and how the game opened up to you as you continued kept bringing me back. And I 100%ed it hmm. in two hours. It's a short game. Hmm. But still... The the hundred percenting took like probably twenty minutes. The the actual game is probably about an hour and a half. But it's just it's a very simple, neat idea, but just the way that everything is is presented is very nice. It's just you wanna keep coming back to it. And that's what is really important when it comes to the games. And that's what people really need to hit, is it's not about your crafting system, it's not about the incredible battle system that you have, because Valkyrie Profile has an amazing one, and I still haven't gone back to play it, even though I always talk about it. Um, there's so many facets to a game, but you want to find the thing that keeps making the player keep pressing A. And that's that's the main thing. It's a very succinct way of putting it, Red Mage. Sorry, that was a long rant. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, that was perfect. Um, Robin, did you have anything to add? Because I think we could call it here, otherwise... I guess, can we just talk about Dark Souls for a little bit in terms of questing? Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah, because Cody, you, you heard me talk about this before off the podcast, but like in Dark Souls 1, you start in the tutorial area and you beat the tutorial area and then you get to the hub, right? It's like there's only one place to go from there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything leads back to you kicking the shit out of the asylum demon. Right, okay. So after the asylum place... You see a bonfire, you're like, okay, bonfires are good, go to bonfire. And there's a guy at the bonfire who doesn't attack you, so he's probably friendly. If you talk to him, he just says, okay, here's the deal. There are two bells, and one's upstairs, one's downstairs. And that's it. That's all you're really given, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, it's for real, for real. That's what he says. Okay, here's the deal. There's two bells. Okay, you go up, and then you go down. That's all he does. And if you try to go downstairs first, you're, you'll be like, Holy shit, you're being attacked by ghosts! <laughs> or skeletons, or something like that. And then it's like, oh no, I can't deal with that. Let's try upstairs. And upstairs is so much easier than downstairs. But like after you deal with everything that's upstairs, and then you ring the first bell, like, yeah, I, f I rang the upstairs bell. Holy shit, now I have to go to the downstairs bell. By then you can deal with it, right? Yeah, because you leveled up. We talked about that a little bit, like, either last cast or, or a while ago, because I think it was just in Skype. Every time you leave the game, you know, and you go back and live your normal life, you come back and you're like, well, what the hell was I doing? All right, there's two bells. Did I already ring the first bell? You know, it's it's simple enough that you'll always remember. You know, you're never truly lost. Mm. Okay, now I was gonna I was just gonna say it. Like I have not. Pl well, okay, that's not true. I have played Dark Souls for like an hour, but then I had to go, and then I never got back to it. Mm. <laughs> it's one of those games that I that I uh, dropped because I just I, I don't know. It didn't really compel me because everybody talked about how great it was, and I played, it and I'm like, this is an NES game in 3D. I can just play an NES game, and it loads faster. Um, but. <laughs> Uh, but that that kind of idea, though, that you have that very limited scope is what we kind of started with when talking back with Final Fantasy Legends. So keeping it small is definitely a good thing. Um, so that that's all I wanted to add. As far as development goes, keep keep the scope of the game, or at least each particular area, rather small. Don't don't open the world at the very beginning. Don't open up everything. Just keep everything very simple, and that that does help in keeping people coming back to it. Yeah, uh, definitely agreed. Um, you know, as much as I don't like level scaling, I think it allows people to explore when you have those kinds of quote-unquote open worlds because 
if you don't do that, then you end up in the Final Fantasy II situation where, you know, someone goes, oh, what am I supposed to do? They go north and die. They go south and die. They go east and die. They go west, they find a town, they keep going west, and then they die. Mm -hmm. So you have to carefully guide the player into what to do because attention spans are only getting shorter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I hate to say that. You know, there are games I don't play because they're on my GameCube, and oh god, I have to walk across the room and turn it on when I'm already on my computer. Heaven forbid I do that. <laughs> but that's the way I play oh. Super Monkey Ball. You know, that's the only way I'm playing Super Monkey Ball. <laughs> uh. <What> a choice. <laughs> that's a well-designed game. Up until, like, <clears throat> Arthropod. Fuck Arthropod, that's an awful level. It's the one with, like, it has, like, the spider-type thing, and it's moving the wheels, and so you have to, and, like, the goals on one of the wheels kind of coming up. So either you wait, like, exactly 20 seconds or something and dash across and hope you get it, or you wait three and then dash across and hope you fall into it as it rotates into the bottom of the wheel. <laughs> like, oh, I've, that's I've that, that sounds some, awful. <laughs> I've seen some of the maps. It has, it has, like, wild map designs, yeah. No, maybe I should go play some Monkey Ball. <laughs> alright well thank you all for listening to the RPG Maker General podcast or the RPG MGP uh, this is Cody happy new year and we'll see y'all next time see you later yeah I hope you all enjoyed the extremely light version of the RPG MGP today uh, <laughs> sorry for coming in late I was asleep because I was had a cold still I'm Blue Sky Robin by the way okay alright bye <laughs> <laughs>